Welcome back to Ami's House. We have the pleasure of having with us today uh, the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute and someone I've been following for a long time, a big intellectual influence of mine, Dr. Yaron Brook. I even got the accent right. Welcome oh, to you got the pronunciation just right. Just right. I, mean, I know yep. that's Price rare. There's a lot of Yorans, Yarens, a lot of that stuff. I've seen you out there, so you, you have to Absolutely. tolerate a lot. <laughs> um, okay, I want to start, and I know you uh, start a lot of uh, appearances this way for people who might not be familiar with Ayn Rand's work and her ideas and the philosophies of objectivism. We have a lot to cover and a lot of topics uh, that I want to get to. But if you could summarize for all of us, just in a few words, sentences, uh, the basic ideas and premises of Ayn Rand and her philosophy, uh, as someone who's been prolific in sharing her, her ideas in the sure. modern world. Sure. I mean, Ayn Rand is, is probably most well known for being a, a advocate for capitalism. She believed in, in real capitalism, laissez-faire capitalism, a separation of state from economics. So the state has no involvement in the economy. Uh, she based this really on her view of ethics, which says that the purpose of life is uh, to use uh, your mind, your reason in pursuit of your values. Uh, the ultimate goal of is your happiness. So she was an egoist in ethics and believed that the only, the only social system appropriate for people pursuing their own values is, um, is freedom, which is capitalism, uh, a system that protects individual rights. And then, um, it, you know, she really based all of this on her idea that, uh, that we are a rational animal, that the means by which we know the world is by using our reason. The world is what it is. It, it's independent of our consciousness, but our consciousness through reason makes it possible for us to understand the world and, and reshape it uh, based on our abilities to uh, take the atoms out there and produce new stuff. And again, mm -hmm. for all of that, you need capitalism, you need freedom. Right. So it sounds like uh, on the economic side of things, there's a lot of agreement to be had amongst these um, freedom circles within politics. There's a lot of agreement about the laissez-faire elements of things. But where objectivism and Ayn Rand's philosophy sort of veers off, especially from other groups in the freedom movement, just speaking loosely, uh, libertarians and other things, there's this sort of reputation that objectivism doesn't quite play well with others because of this sort of naivete when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to the non-aggression principle being taken to such an extreme that any form of government, any form of force um, must be removed from society, purely volunteer society, that whole area which I've seen you butt heads with with a lot of prominent libertarian <laughs> thinkers and figures. So I'm curious where it veers off from the libertarian strain that tends to be very isolationist, very against getting involved in uh, any war by of any kind that that's a that's considered wrong just because like where, where are the where are those distinct differences? Well, there, there are a number of different places. Uh, mm -hmm. First, you know, we, we don't advocate for uh, a uh, non-aggression uh, principle axiom starting point. I mean, mm -hmm. non-aggression is a consequence of a whole chain of reasoning and a whole philosophy, which libertarians don't have. So they take Ayn Rand's non-aggression and they make it into their starting point and they, and they ignore everything that comes before that. But if you understand her philosophy, the essential element in her philosophy is focused on the individual's ability to prosper and be successful and, uh, and again, use his own mind in pursuit of his own values. And uh, so defense of rights, and, and as a consequence, she believes that government is a necessary good, not a necessary evil, or not, and she's not an anarchist, which is, of course, where we really butt heads mm. with the with the uh, libertarian uh, anarchists, who I think these days are, are, seem to be a majority among libertarians. And then what happens is that, uh, I, I, as objectivists, we can look at different countries, we can look at different situations in the world, and see certain movements, certain. Uh, countries are generally broadly pro individual rights. They they lead to human flourishing, not as much as we would want, not as good as we would like them to be, but they're, they're generally positive. And there are other countries that are clearly negative, horrible, destructive of of individual rights and destructive of the ability of individuals to live their own lives. And we describe those as evil regimes, as, as negative regimes. Libertarians typically don't make those judgments. You know, whatever people want, 
they get. Uh, and since anarchy is the standard, for them, all governments are bad. And there's no difference between, let's say, the United States and Saudi Arabia and, uh, and uh, Russia and China. I mean, they're all just, I don't know, they're all just states and states are all bad and therefore we can't differentiate. So that's one big difference. The other is that because we don't reject the state per se, we believe that states have a duty, a responsibility to their citizens to protect them. So wars of self-defense are necessary, just like individuals have a right to defend themselves. We basically have governments partially to be able to provide us with that self-defense against other governments or against terrorist organizations or uh, other foreign entities mm -hmm. uh, that might want to do harm uh, to, uh, to us. And therefore, it, it's completely legitimate to go to war if the war is a self-defense war, if a war is a war aimed at protecting the rights of, uh, of your own citizens. So a quick technical question on that, because I've heard you describe this idea that there is no collective brain, there is no group think, there is no common good. We are made up of individuals. So how do you square that idea with the idea of governments that act collectively on behalf of a nation to engage in force, even if it's necessary and justified, to, to engage in, in, in war or fighting? You know, so I'm just, how, how do we square those two ideas? Well, well, first, you know, the, the government is there to protect individual rights. So it's mm -hmm. to protect the rights of individuals to pursue their life. But the reality is that uh, there are occasions when people threaten that life. Uh, we have a police force in order to deal with that. And we have processes and procedures in terms of identifying criminals, putting them up to trial and, 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 and so on in order for the, for the, for the government to use retaliatory force against those criminals. Mm -hmm. and, and we have a whole process to do that, to try to make sure that they don't go after innocent people, they don't go after bad uh, you know, people who don't deserve it, mm -hmm. and that the whole orientation is the protection of the individual rights of the innocent. But it stems, it's rooted and, in one's individual right to self-defense, and we extrapolate upon that. Therefore, the, the, the collective yeah. government representing that individual has the right to the retaliatory use of force because exactly. an individual can defend themselves. The problem is, when we, once we get into entanglements and nation states fighting, there's a lot of collateral damage. There's a lot of things like when I defend myself against someone breaking into my house, I'm defending myself against the, that person directly, and I, we're the, we are the parties involved. Once the nation yeah. states begin going to war, it implicates a lot of other things which I want to get into but yeah. sure but but the point is that you know if your kid is kidnapped the job yeah. of the government is to go and find him mm -hmm. right and there might even be collateral damage in a situation like that imagine a, a a kidnapping situation where your kid is kidnapped but there are a bunch of other innocent hostages mm -hmm. in trying to free your kid the government might they, they it might you know kill some innocents and whose fault is that it's the fault of the kidnappers from a moral perspective from a practical perspective it is the fault of the kidnappers not the fault of those trying to do the right thing trying to protect individual rights by by uh by freeing the hostages mm -hmm. so uh take uh, take the situation with the nation states or, or even worse terrorists uh when um 9 11 happened my life was in danger right they were coming after me you anybody in the united states it just happened to be those three thousand people who died but it could have been us and mm -hmm. so it's completely legitimate for us to say to our government look there's a threat identify it and destroy it now granted we do not have the in my view the right procedures the right processes uh in, in or that we use um internally we don't apply those uh, as rigorously to international affairs for example you know historically it's only congress that's allowed to declare war we now have presidents who can do, you know, can declare war on anybody at any time, pretty much. Uh, we, you know, we shouldn't have a police state that listens into our phone conversations and, uh, and, and, and rec records them or, or uh, you know, inventories them. And yet we do in the name of national security. So, look, the, the government today is far from ideal. Mm -hmm. But in principle, it has a responsibility as our representative to use force in order to defend us, mm -hmm. not to use force in any other context, but to use force in order to defend our rights. Right. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's nice that we have a volunteer army. It's great that we have a volunteer army. It's not a, it's not a, a conscripted army. Mm -hmm. So th th those are not being sent there by force. Uh, and, uh, 
you know, we just need the right processes uh, in the government uh, and maybe go back to the kind of processes the founders imagined or maybe come up with new ones, given that we know a lot more today than we did back then about what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it's part of the job of the government to protect Mm -hmm. its citizens. This is a manifestation of that. And uh, one more sort of macro question. Everyone would understand that in that context, like if Mexico or Canada hypothetically attacked us or any country directly attacked the mainland United States or even bases of the United States around the world, that would require the United States to respond. How does it work when it comes to allies of the United States, for example, with Israel, where, you know, we're seeing a lot of this debate, this academic discussion about how America should support other countries and to what extent, whether it's troops, uh, aid packages um, and that kind of thing. To what extent is it still self-defense when supporting other countries that are fighting yes, comparable enemies? So it yeah. depends on a variety of different parameters. Um, for example, who is the enemy? Mm-hmm. Is the enemy also an enemy of the U.S.? Is, uh, is the destruction of the enemy in America's interest, in the, in, in the interest of American individuals? Mm-hmm. That is, do, does that enemy pose a threat to American individuals? If it does, then it makes sense to support an effort. Whether you send troops or not would depend on how imminent the threat to America is. For example, Israel has never requested American troops and they're not necessary. Um, whether one wants to, you know, use money or, or just sell weapons depends on the context of the country and depends on the context of the existing government. I mean, we have a government today that spends, what, $4 trillion uh, on BS. Mm-hmm. Not, you know, uh, 75% of it is complete BS. Uh, to send a fraction of that to an ally fighting a war that helps our interests, mm-hmm. you know, maybe in a laissez-faire capitalist uh, country, where the government would spend, you know, 80% less than what it spends today, then it would make sense and we wouldn't be giving eight packages. But today it's a blimp uh, with regard to the amount of money being spent. It's insignificant. Yeah. The, 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 there's so many other things that are less worthy mm. than sending money to Ukraine or to Israel that complaining about that is absurd given given all the stuff they allocated. What, they just approve $1.2 billion uh, Biden just signed, Republicans voted for it in the House and the Senate of basically taking our money and burning it or, or handing it over <laughs> to many people who don't deserve to have it, subsidizing stuff. Just, just yeah. you know, uh, you know, and this is just like a quarter of the total budget. It's not even, it's not even, that's right. $1.2 trillion in, in what people are complaining about. Yeah. So in the priorities more. of things to start cutting, you know, yeah. the truth is, in Israel's defense, I think Israeli and American troops would not would not blend well together. Probably the, the, not. The patient's then, temperament would be really messed up. Have you ever seen Israelis play basketball? It's like one every. They're each one is playing a one on one. It's kind of crazy. It's, it's a, <laughs> and and then you know in Israel, Ryan, Ryan, Israel no 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 Ryan, Ryan, boo, 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 boo. come 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 on. They just, Israel it, doesn't it, want troops. No. <laughs> and and the other aspect of this is, you know, granted Israel probably doesn't need the money. That is, mm-hmm. Israel is in a position to be able to probably buy the weapons itself. It doesn't. Have, it's a relatively rich country. I hate. When America gives Israel money for nothing, the, mm. the the economic aid or whatever, Israel doesn't need it. It's a developed country. It shouldn't accept it, and America shouldn't offer it. Mm-hmm. But think about even this, right? Yeah. It, the United States gives money to 120 different countries in the world, 120. Most of those countries, an overwhelming majority of those countries, are hostile to the United States. So the United States gives money to countries hostile to the United States. So when it gives money to a country that's actually friendly to the United States— then we complain. Mm-hmm. Right? Which countries would you say, for example, Qatar? Like, which countries are you, are you speaking of? Well, Qatar is a massive example. Qatar yeah. is funding, is a fund of ISIS. It's a, it was a fund of ISIS, still probably is a fund of ISIS. The Russians should probably go after Qatar now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the Russian terrorist attack just happened yeah. uh, right this weekend. Uh, it, you know, it, we fund uh, Egypt, about the same amount the money we give to. I mean, Egypt's not hostile to the United States, but it's not exactly our best friend. It's not mm-hmm. exactly a... Uh, what do you call it? What do we call it? A liberal democracy? Not at all. It's an authoritarian state. We fund dozens of countries, Africa, all over Asia. We throw money around all over the place. But the only country that it seems that people kind of uh, object to, to giving money to is Israel. Now, I'm against giving it to Israel, but I'm also against giving it to all the, 100, 100, all the other 120 countries mm-hmm. as well. And again, it's a blimp in, in the bigger picture. So... Um, well, there I seems to be a resent. There, there was a resentment in the West. It seems to prosperous countries helping prosperous countries. It's only when there's this asymmetric thing going on that seems to 
morally jive with. Uh, you well, of say course, the, that's, you know. that's that's Christian morality. Yeah. You know, Christian oh, morality is you, you 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 help the poor, the poor are virtuous, the poor yeah. good, so you help them. Uh, and if if you support in any way, even just morally support or sell weapons to the strong, mm. the able, then that's a violation of your morality because yeah. they are almost by necessity, the bad guys. So, so that's, you know, that Christian morality has been secularized by the woke left and, uh, an intersectionality in that sense is, is just a secularization of these ideas. And so today Israel is evil because it's strong and rich and successful. And the Palestinians are good because they're weak, uh, and, uh, and poor and weakness and poverty give you uh, give you a leg up on you know it means you're you're oppressed right it couldn't be your fault that you're poor so it must be because you're oppressed and if you're oppressed you're virtuous mm-hmm. and if you're rich you must be an oppressor couldn't have been that you created the wealth yourself and therefore you must be a bad guy mm-hmm. so tying into that uh, shifting onto Israel Gaza the current war and you know without getting into the whole history of it I'm curious. Um, y- what your position is, how this morality, this morality of altruism, uh, what people like to put forth about what the IDF is doing as virtuous, the fact that it is compassionate, the fact that it drops leaflets, that it makes priorities of protecting yeah. civilian life, not just on its side, but also on the Palestinian side. I would, I, I happen to have seen your take on it, and I think for our audience it's interesting to kind of go there, because I've spent a lot of time on the pro-Israel side of these things, making these cases about Israel. Um, but at the same time, now that we're kind of both on similar uh, in, in similar positions on defending the idea of as just, to what extent do you think it doing what it does is morally courageous versus morally weak? I think it's clearly morally weak and existentially weak. That is, it's morally weak um, because it's not the IDF's responsibility to protect the civilians of Gaza. It's Hamas's responsibility. Hamas is the official recognized government of Gaza. Mm -hmm. Its responsibility is to protect the individual rights of its civilians, and it's doing the exact opposite. Uh, And and it's practically weak because the reality of it is that it puts Israeli soldiers at risk. Uh, It it has created whatever casualties Israel has taken in Gaza, which are amazingly low, Mm -hmm. but, you know, given the kind of combat they engaged in, but still significant. Uh, But it places those soldiers at much greater risk. It prolongs the war. It makes the war much longer, which, by the way, prolongs the suffering of Gazans. I, mm. You know, I wonder if Israel had been unequivocally ruthless in the first few days after October 7th and and if the war wouldn't be over by now and hostages back home or, or dead and and the leadership of Hamas dead and it'd be over and, and maybe the same number of Palestinians overall in terms of civilians would have been killed. It's mm. not clear to me that you actually save lives, right? If Hiroshima and Nagasaki don't happen, Mm -hmm. probably more Japanese civilians die, not less, right? So sometimes being ruthless in the short run actually saves the enemy civilian lives in the long run. Uh, You know, America's weakness in Iraq, uh, you know, a war they should have gone into to begin with, but once they were there, they should have at least won. Mm -hmm. Uh, America's weakness in Iran, in Iraq, in terms of, just this issue actually, I think, caused hundreds of thousands of Iraqi casualties because it allowed the insurgents to rise up. The insurgents mainly killed other Iraqis. They killed each other. They killed less Americans. Uh, But if you really taught them a lesson, if you'd really crushed them right in the beginning, they would have never been an insurgency Mm -hmm. and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis would have been saved, even though initially more would have died. Yeah. Let's just take all yeah. that in for, for, um, for someone. Saw, who, yeah. For someone who's who's a little bit less familiar, mm-hmm. um, that that's a pretty. Uh, Michael's a Marxist, by the way. I've had him here the whole time, ready to challenge. <laughs> no, I'm just know, kidding. You know, the, the Fountainhead's my favorite book, actually, but um, mm-hmm. um, I'm not as familiar with that. I know no, quite but, a few Marxists who <laughs> love the Fountainhead. <laughs> oh, interesting. They oh. misunderstand it, but they love it. Oh, wow. It's that it's quite a radical take. It um, is definitely it sounds a, radical to me. It definitely is more on the radical take. I, I'm also curious. It sounds like the the moral standard once you're at war is victory and swiftness like be quick be ruthless be swift and end the war but the question the question is put put your people at the least risk possible that Mm -hmm. is uh that that's what i think uh, you know a a proper foreign policy and and an egoistic uh, you know to to use a phrase abused today to no end an america first uh attitude is or an israeli first attitude is you 
place your own people at minimal risk and you destroy the enemy and you win as quickly as possible. And look, I wrote a whole essay on this. People can find it. Mm-hmm. It's called Just War Theory versus America. Uh, it's, it's online. Just War Theory is a theory that was developed over many centuries by Christian uh, theologians, primarily uh, Augustine and then Thomas Aquinas, mm-hmm. and then was secularized in the, in the, uh, in the post-World War II by a number of secular philosophy philosophers, and it's become the standard guide for America's wars. And as a consequence, you can see directly, America has not won a war since World War II. Mm-hmm. It didn't win Korea, didn't win Vietnam, it really didn't win Iraq. It really didn't win Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. It, it, it can't win a war because it doesn't know how to fight a war. The idea, oh, look, a war is the most barbaric thing human beings can do to one another. It's the most barbaric activity people engage in. And to suddenly say, oh, no, no, we're going to impose rules on the barbarism only helps the bad guys. It only helps the true barbarians. It only helps the people who start the war to begin with. Mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't help you win and it doesn't help you stop and it doesn't help you in the long run. Mm -hmm. So getting into the weeds of it, are there then limits to the retaliation in terms of, I I don't mean proportionality in the way that MSNBC uses it. I mean, in the sense that if the, a proper response is to win strategically and (coughs) never compromise your strategic advantage because you put your own citizens and civilians at risk and that is immoral to do. And and by the way, you put, you put at risk future peace You put at risk true victory, which is peace in the end. You know, there's no accident the Japanese don't hate America. They don't. If you go to Japan, they're very friendly to Americans. It's not an accident Germans don't hate America and England. They don't like speaking English or whatever, from what I hear. They They don't like speaking English, English. but that's a different issue. No, I know, I know. But, 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 you know, know, Britain flattened Dresden, right? They killed hundreds of thousands of people. And the Germans don't resent them for that. So there's a reason for that, because they won. And it, it forced the Germans to change their attitude and actually establish peace uh, for the longest period in Europe, maybe yeah. ever. Is there is does that go to to say that? Um, does it make the case that all war inherently is ideological and not necessarily de- uh, not or at least in the cases of Europe, Nazi Germany, imperialist Japan, radical Islamic terrorism today, and the uh, is, is underlying all of this really not geography but ideology? Yeah, it, it, it usually. Uh, in, in the modern world, at least, mm-hmm. in the post-Enlightenment world, I think the probably post-Westphalian um, world of nation states, most wars are either ideological or wars of de- 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 defining boundaries, right? Defining mm-hmm. boundaries. But uh, like, I don't know, the Balkan wars of the 1990s were, mm-hmm. were splitting off and, and balkanization, creating your own little state and fighting off. But but yeah, I, I, I think... At the end of the day, even that is driven by ideology, an ideology of ethnic, ethnicity. You know, my ethnicity is unique, uh, the ideology of nationalism. Yeah, all wars at the end of the day, all, all modern wars are, are, are in, the, in the West at least are, are ideological wars. Right. And to your point, I mean, I, I hear this argument a lot, like with the collateral damage that we're seeing in Gaza, don't you create more terrorists, more resentment to the West, more resentment to Israel? But then if you look at examples of Nazi Germany and imperialist Japan, that wasn't the case. Now, I don't know in what sense that that's transferable between those societies of those in the 40s and 50s to what we're dealing with now. Do you see it as the same in that populations will eventually turn on their regimes that oppress them by seeing the wrath of and, and the ruthlessness of the armies that defend themselves? I do. I don't see any reason why it doesn't apply. That is, mm-hmm. you need to bring them to their knees. You need to, you need to bring them to the conclusion. And I, I know bring them to their knees is, mm. is tough, but you need to bring them to the conclusion that they're, um, they're embracing a violence, mm-hmm. it's self-defeating. They're embracing a violence will only bring violence upon them and with their suffering and suffering to themselves and to their children, their families, and to everything that they value. And at the end of the day, the only way they can escape this violence mm-hmm. is by you know, reconstituting the ideology that drives their society. It requires a cultural change. The only way is through some kind of shock therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, It doesn't happen without it. You know, it's very, very rare that you see peace negotiated that lasts. Almost all peace that lasts is a result of victory, not of negotiation. 
I mean, there are lots of negotiations for peace all over the world. And how long does it last? Nothing Well, happened. Israel's won many wars and still finds itself with his hands tied. Because it's never them. defeated the mm -hmm. enemy completely, right? Yeah. It never has. It's, uh, it's, uh, by the way, it's always been stopped. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no question that Israel defeating the Egyptians as thoroughly as they did and coming so close to really wiping them out in 1973 led Sadat, you know, he had his best shot. That was his best shot ever to beat Israel. And it still won. And that's what brought him to the negotiating table. That's what established peace between Israel and Egypt. If Israel had never crossed the Suez Canal, it, I don't know how many of your listeners know about this, this, the Yom Kippur War, but, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, the... Well, Egyptians, with Helen Mirren and everything, she kind of brought it to light a little bit. So I'm probably go. now. <laughs> That's right, the, the movie. Uh, but if, if the Egyptians crossed the Suez Canal, they, they were on the Israeli side of the Sinai, they had, you know, that a clear path north. If there had been some kind of ceasefire and end where the Israelis were backed up and the Egyptians were on that side of the Sinai and Israel never crosses the Suez Canal, there's not, there would not be peace. Mm -hmm. Sadat would have said, ah, I won this time. I'll try again next time. Maybe I'll win a little bit more territory. Mm -hmm. The fact that Israel beat them back and almost destroyed the entire third army, I mean, really mass, it, it completely destroyed them. Mm -hmm. um, is what led to peace. So, yeah, the thing that stands out to me is the word army. As you said, they almost destroyed it. the army. I can see the comment sections coming in on these episodes, and I'm sure you're no stranger to it, these accusations, the slander of Israel being this genocidal regime that is intentionally targeting, targeting Palestinians simply because of their ethnicity. And these things, obviously, crazy. I mean, you, you don't have to convince me that they're false charges, but the idea is when you say words like wipe them out or destroy them completely, I guess I'm curious what the limits of retaliate retali retaliation are in terms of strategic advantage once you have clear victory past that point if you continue uh do we now are we now subjecting israel to sort of a moral judgment of you know if, yeah, if I mean, civilians it, it, die as a result that aren't strategically advantageous the, or collateral damage to you fighting an enemy now you've crossed a certain line sure, sure. Yeah. i mean the only violence that's legitimate is the violence absolutely necessary for victory mm -hmm. once the victory has been achieved violence should end Mm -hmm. should should stop um and if it, you know gratuitous violence is always immoral and wrong uh, uh forms of violence massacring civilians just for the sake of massacring obviously is wrong mm -hmm. uh it, you know the the whole idea is what is the you know coming up with a strategy to defeat your enemy and uh that should be the focus the focus should be how to win this war as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. You know, thoroughly, I mean, with as few casualties on your own side. But that does not involve gratuitous violence. And as I said before, I actually think it involves less casualties on the other side than, uh, than, uh, than, it, than, it, than kind of a prolonged war that keeps them going and they keep popping up of tunnels and they're going into hospitals and then you have to go in again and civilians get caught in the crossfire again. And it's just this endless battles that never, you know, that, that, that keep inflicting pain on, on civilian population. That to me is much more damaging than get it over with, do it and, and win and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and come home in a sense. Interesting. Any questions there, Michael, that are hitting you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to trying to wrestle that. Well, I mean, I guess uh, my question that that pops pops in my mind is, it's it's easy to say that from where we're sitting. Um, you know, when you see pictures come out of Gaza and you, um, you know, and, and you just feel intuitively like this is awful. You know, how do you how do how do you sort of square that? Um, in that moment, um, between what you know and what you're feeling. As someone who regards human life as, a, as the high standard. It's of absolutely awful. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. It's particularly children. It's, it's very, very depressing. And the blame is 100%, not 99.9, 100% on Hamas. Mm -hmm. So imagine if Hamas went into some way and just slaughtered a bunch of people, as they did on October 7th. I mean, you're, it's horrible. And it's Hamas's fault. Every single kid that dies in Gaza, it doesn't matter whose bullet it is, is Hamas's fault. Mm -hmm. So I find it horrible. I find it depressing. It's sad, just like any massacre committed, any killing committed by the bad guys. But it's the bad guys. And the only way to stop it, and if you understand, the only way to stop it, not just tomorrow, but the only way to stop it for the next 20 years is to thoroughly destroy Hamas. If you don't, that's fine. 
then you'll just have to fight this again in five years and 10 years and 15 years and 20 years. I mean, look, I, I, you know, the nice thing about, uh, about this is, is I have a record here, right? Uh, when, when Oslo was signed, I said, you know, with, with Yasser Arafat, I said, this is going to lead to more bloodshed, not to more peace. It did. Mm -hmm. Every time Israel negotiated with the PLO, a terrorist organization, it, more violence occurred. Every time they got tough with the PLO, violence declined. And when they ultimately compromised almost everything and gave the PLO almost everything they wanted, in return, they got a second intifada, which I don't know if you guys, you guys are too young to remember this, but this is a period of years where buses would explode and we were 15, would 16. Yeah, we were. I, yeah, I mean, this well. is 2000. I couldn't go to Israel for the summer. And it was a bummer. I remember. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, yeah, yeah. we it were was, teenagers, but yes, of course. It was horrific. Sabaros and, and uh, pizza shops. and. But that's what happens yeah. when you negotiate with mm -hmm. evil people. It mm -hmm. always does. So at some, and then of course, uh, Hamas takes over Gaza in 2007. And since then, how many kind of war skirmishes if they've been yeah. almost every year, there's something going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, we can continue that and have an October 7th every few years or maybe build better walls and there won't be an October 7th with our self fire missiles over the border. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, the the, 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 the the problem with Israel is that it has a high tolerance for its own casualties and it has a high tolerance for being the victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, But this war in Gaza right now, should have been done in 2008. Mm -hmm. so you, you and it would the, have been easier in 2008. Mm -hmm. You use the term Hamas took over in 2007. Do you differ, differentiate between governments that don't get voted in democratically and it's the citizens' um, responsibility to it and, and vice versa and governments that that do? Well, it's, it's rare you're ever going to go to war with a government that has uh, that was elected. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. that's a reality. Governments who are elected don't typically initiate force, uh, you know, unless you count the Russian election as an election, which I don't. Or, or a culture or cultures that necessarily don't have democratic or, or I would say, you know, liberty minded values, uh, tolerant values. But, you know, the idea of yeah, yeah. I mean, you've famously talked about you're not into democracy. This idea of no. majority rule doesn't necessarily mean virtuous just because a bunch of people picked it. It might no, just reflect but I think what the majority giving, feels. Giving, giving people yeah. a say in their yeah. own governance is a virtue, is a good yeah. thing. I, you know, democracy, i.e. straight up majority rule about everything is, mm. is bad. Yeah. But uh, th there's nothing wrong with a vote, you know, on, on, uh, on specific issues uh, and, and who should govern. Uh, look, uh, at the end of the day, take, for example, Hamas. Hamas won an election. Then, of course, nobody wanted to recognize that election because who the hell would want Hamas? So there was a civil war between uh, the Hamas and the PLO. The Hamas won it. By the way, uh, they won it by slaughtering and butchering everybody who was affiliated with the PLO, right? I mean, this is not; these are not nice guys. Fatah and, and they, PLO are synonymous, I, I presume. Fatah and Gaza of PLO. Fatah, yeah. Palestinian Authority, are all Com competing basically with PLO. But yeah. okay, call them call them Palestinian Authority mm. to, to be nice to them. <laughs> um, but, but you know, they are offshoot basically or development of uh, the PLO. Mahmoud mm. Abbas, who's the president of the Palestinian Authority, was Arafat's number two at the PLO. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's not a reach. Mm. Um, but look, the population of Gaza in every survey done before October 7th, supports Hamas. The population of Gaza after October 7th supported what Hamas did during October 7th. Mm -hmm. The population of Gaza has not uh, risen up against Hamas. Now, you could argue it's difficult. Maybe, maybe not, but they haven't. Um, the population of Gaza bears at least some of the responsibility without any question for what Hamas does. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the videos of October 7th, those weren't exactly Hamas-trained fighters doing all the raping and pillaging and murdering. A lot of them were just regular people from Gaza who the Hamas guy said, hey, join us, let's go, let's go rape and pillage a little bit. And, and, and when they, you called their families and yeah. uh, you know, told them how wonderful it was to kill Jews, I didn't hear the family, the mother saying, that's really bad, come home, you, you really should be punished for this. No, they were, they were celebrating this. So uh, That's what Douglas to... Murray said. Douglas Murray said they were absolutely elated when they did Yes, it. well, <laughs> Douglas Murray has a way with words that yes, I do he not. He's, he's great. <laughs> I love him. I love him. Yeah. Um, but it's... <laughs> So you can't yeah. you can't say oh the, the Palestinian po civilian population has no 
blame in this. They have every blame in this. Now, again, children are innocent, so one's heart, uh, you know, aches for the for the lives of children. Um, but it, this is all in Hamas, and, and in a sense, on their parents for allowing mm-hmm. Hamas to do what they did. It, adults in Gaza are responsible for what they do, mm-hmm. and uh, they have done mostly what they've done is support is support Hamas and those who oppose Hamas, those who would like to see a liberty-minded Gaza Strip, mm-hmm. I think welcome Israel's attacks and welcome the possibility that maybe after Israel's victory, more liberty-minded people might come to to, to govern uh, Gaza. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing that was circulating post-October 7th in the conversations around Israel was, that we used to discuss on several episodes, was one thing seems pretty clear that everyone can agree upon, left and right of Israel, is that status quo, for a long time, I think the sort of Netanyahu sort of ideas, like we can just, like as you said, keep this the way it is and tolerate yeah. a few rockets here and there. They would tolerate that status quo, while the sort of anti-occupation left-wing movements of Israel and abroad would say, we cannot continue this way. The occup- Something has to change. My question to you is, in what sense going forward, is there an ultimate solution for Israel to be fully secure, and that plays into the question of, uh, tying into the question of a one-state solution, two-state solution, to what extent is the West Bank and Gaza, should it be part of Israel proper? What do you do about trying, this idea of having a Jewish nation-state, and to what extent does that square with objectivism as far as nation-states based around a character, a Jewish majority? All those kind of questions, because the idea of just leaving this as is leads to more bloodshed. So what do you do? A lot of questions you're asking there. Yeah. Uh, We can take take the Jewish state later. Um, so, first, there is no solution in the short run. Mm-hmm. The, the notion of a two-state solution is bizarre, right? Mm-hmm. In a sense, there was two states. Uh, Gaza was a, was a state. Mm-hmm. It was a state. Israel did not occupy Gaza, this idea that Gaza was under occupation. Of course, there were some uh, limitations on what kind of products could go into Gaza. <laughs> it, it's a state at war with Israel. Why would and, and in spite of that, Israel supplied Gaza with electricity, with water, with food, uh, with all kinds of stuff that no other state in human history has supplied its enemy. Mm-hmm. It's never happened. Uh, Gaza didn't spend the billions and billions of dollars they got from the Arab world to build their own water wells and their own desalination plants and their own electricity. None of that was, was, was used. It was used to build tunnels and to buy weapons. Right? So uh, we had a two-state solution, and it failed. Mm-hmm. There is no possibility to have a two-state solution with people, to have a solution with people who want to kill you um, uh, and, and have a border with you and have, give them their own state, and then they can launch rockets. You know, and and if, they, if you do that on the, on the West Bank, then the rockets are two minutes from Tel Aviv instead of 10 minutes from Tel Aviv, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, people don't understand the, the, the issue of the distances, but the distances, I mean, at the, at the thinnest point, the green line, mm-hmm. right, uh, which is the 1967 border and the Mediterranean Sea is like, what, a five to 10 minute drive yeah. at, the, at the narrowest portion? I, really, I mean, imagine October 7th coming in, from the West Bank into uh, into some of those settlements or into uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, neighborhoods of Tel Aviv, mm-hmm. so there there is no two state solution anytime soon. I don't care, you know, in twenty years, sure. Um, but what has to happen between now and twenty years is there has to be a fundamental, deep change in Palestinian culture. That is, they have to stop teaching their kids that suicide bombers are heroes, that killing Jews is a good thing, that uh, driving the Jews into the sea or sending them back to Europe or whatever is the solution. Mm-hmm. And by the way, this is, this is a majority of the Palestinians believe that th- there's only one state solution. It's an Arab state and Jews should be eradicated, You'd be eliminated right, yeah. or thrown out. Mm-hmm. That's what they believe, a significant majority of them. Poll after poll shows this. Uh, Palestinians still... Uh, you know, hold on to a, a, a culture of barbarism, a culture of, that is barbaric. It's, it's not a culture of liberty. It's not a culture of freedom. It's not a culture of individualism. It's not a culture that respects human life or respects individual life. It doesn't respect their own people's lives. It doesn't respect their own individualism. It, you know, it, you don't want to be on the, in the West Bank and disagree with Hamas or, or or, or um, the Palestinian authorities. There is no freedom of speech in the, in, in, in the West Bank, in this Palestinian state. So 
that has to change. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole population needs to change culturally. It, whether that's possible or not is a real question. I think it's possible. All human beings have the capacity to adopt pro-liberty positions. Mm-hmm. Or, and I'm not talking here about pro-liberty, i.e. objectivist. I'm just talking about basic, I used liberal democracy before, mm-hmm. you know, basic, you know, uh, a European, American, fundamental values watered down as much as they are, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, from the founding or from uh, the values I uphold. Palestinians need to adopt those. And they never have, right? They've had lots of opportunities for two-state solutions. They constantly reject them. Uh, and they reject them because what would they do with the state? And, and the state would be an authoritarian state that was uh, was horrible to its own citizens and would be would be committed to destroying Israel. So if the Palestinians achieve uh, an acceptance of the existence of the state of Israel, if the Palestinians are dedicated to a relatively free state, if they are committed to changing their textbooks and getting rid of all the stuff about uh, shahids and suicide bombers and the yeah. virtues of killing Jews, mm-hmm. then sure, two-state solution would be amazing. Um, of course, once they become fully kind of pro-free, pro-liberty, then a one-state solution is fine as well from my perspective. So yeah, on that front, even you're saying major- population, the majority, Jewish majority, Jewish minority aside, that doesn't concern you. The case that is often made about the existence of Israel as a secure Jewish state that does protect the minorities within it, but still maintains a Jewish majority for the sake of protection of Jews worldwide. Does that not concern you? No, I think I, I think uh, Israel's unique, and I get into trouble all of, all yeah. the time about this. Um, I think Israel's unique because anti-Semitism is unique. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, anti-Semitism seems to be around always. <laughs> mm-hmm. It seems to be everywhere. It seems to be prevalent. It doesn't matter if we, if those of us born Jews try to assimilate completely or not, they come after us. They, they, they hate us and they want to kill us. Um, you know, if Jews could assimilate, I'd be for assimilation. <laughs> but uh, the reality is that, as Herzl discovered during the Dreyfus trial, um, the Jews can't assimilate. Uh, that is, even in America, look at what's happening right now with, with the anti-Semitism rising up. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, anti-Semitism existed even back then because that's why, po- you know, people don't know this, but before World War II, as Jews were escaping the Nazis, America wouldn't let them in. Mm-hmm. After World War II, They'd seen, you know, there were, there were hundreds of thousands of survivors of the camps, of the concentration camps. And America wouldn't let them in, right? They, they wanted to come to America, and literally they voted on it in Congress. It, Truman wanted them in. It, it, you know, Congress voted not to allow Jews in. So you could argue anti-Semitism is everywhere, even in the face of the Holocaust, anti-Semitism is everywhere. There needs to be a place on the planet where Jews can go to no matter what. So the right of the right of Aliyah, the right of emigration into Israel by Jews should be sustained no matter what one state, two state solution is adopted. Uh, and that needs to be secured and guaranteed in a constitution. But if you do that, once that's done and once that's protected and, and we're convinced that it won't be changed ever, Mm-hmm. then I don't care if it's a one-state or two-state solution. Do you get in trouble in objectivist circles for saying that, or do you get in trouble in uh, other circles for saying that? Like, where does the pushback come from? Because it seems like it's the objectivist exception because anti-Semitism is such a unique hatred, such a unique evil, that while obviously nation states, I mean, America, people take for granted, is unique. It's the melting pot of, doesn't have a central character, doesn't have a central identity, other than immigrants from around the world that make it. It does have a central character and identity. I mean, that's what it makes America, America. It's central character and central identity. Not based on an ethnicity or anything. No, but it's the founding fathers. It's an idea. America is a unique country. And it was founded on an idea. And that makes it, I think, the greatest country ever. But I agree with you. So, but as that, it doesn't apply necessarily to is, I mean, to these other countries around the world that all have common more, more, you know, based around central identities or ethnicities or religions. I, um, I'm just curious how this squares with, yeah, where do you get pushback from on, you said you get in trouble from I that. get pushback from the so-called libertarians, right? Uh-huh. So, the, so the other freedom people and, mm-hmm. you know, and some people who think of themselves as, as, as objectives. But look, uh, you know, the, the, the ethnic character of Israel is unfortunate. 
And in an ideal world, it wouldn't, I would be against it. Mm -hmm. But we don't live in an ideal world. And one of the things we have to recognize is that we don't. And you have to, you, you don't say, okay, I don't, I, I don't live in an ideal world, but I'm going to live out my ideals even if it means I'm killed, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a Jew. I'm going to sacrifice myself for the sake of some ideal world. That would be bizarre. Jews need to do what's necessary, you know, to stay alive. Mm -hmm. And if that requires a state, and I think it does, then they need a state. And uh, as long as that state is free, as long as that state treats all its citizens equally, and uh, it, it can have all kinds of different immigration policies. I prefer more open than closed, but uh, it should have a, clearly that from a, for Jews, the, 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 the border is open. Mm hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, there happens to be a lot of a fair amount of Israelis at the Enron Institute. I mean, it's yeah, I don't know. There's you, Elon. There's a bunch of people. I don't know. Yeah, what? a lot. <laughs> yeah, always have been. Right. That's interesting. Tal, Tal, the CEO of the Institute right now, is an Israeli. Yeah. yeah. What's the reason there? Any, any? Is that just a coincidence? It's the same coincidence <laughs> uh, with regard to uh, the number of Jews among the yeah. intellectual leadership of yeah. objectivism. Right. Ayn Rand comes from a Jewish origin. Right. Um, Leonard Peikoff comes from right. a Jewish origin, uh, Harry Ben Swanger, Peter Schwartz, mm -hmm. and almost everybody, <laughs> uh, at least in the, or in the founding generation, not everybody, but a big chunk of them. I mean, I meant that I'll marry a Jewish man, but mm -hmm. pretty much everybody else uh, were Jewish. I think it has to do with a, with a particularly Jewish culture that is open to ideas and, mm -hmm. and open to uh, arguments and open to disputation. I think it has to do with the fact that every intellectual movement out there in the world, mm -hmm. even the bad ones are led by Jews. <laughs> Jews just, it's true. I mean, if yeah. the, the worst leftists are Jews, Noam mm -hmm. Chomsky comes to mind. Right. Um, you know, the worst rightists tend to be Jews. I know, uh, Jew, you know, Jew hating Jews on the right. So mm -hmm. um, they always have been. And, and uh, environmentalists, every movement out there uh, that is intellectual by its nature, you know, the neoconservatives uh, were led by Jews. It's, it's because... Jews disproportionately tend to be oriented towards the intellectual fields mm -hmm. and be interested in these things for cultural reasons, which are interesting. Oh, I, I want to get into all that. I, I, as far as um, was I, in terms of Anne Rand, having known her uh, and her ideas really closely, like to what extent was her Jewish identity that relevant to her? It wasn't. It is about as relevant as mine is to me. Maybe, <laughs> maybe for her, maybe for her it was less because she didn't grow up in Israel. So for me, uh -huh. it, it it has been. Look, she grew up in a, in a middle-class Jewish family before the revolution in Russia and then experienced the revolution in Russia and managed to escape in, in the 1920s. She said she didn't consider herself Jewish mm -hmm. except in the face of anti-Semitism. And to a large extent, I, I think of myself that way as well. I, I don't consider myself Jewish except in the face of anti-Semitism or, or the anti-Israeli or whatever, whatever we want to, you know, the, mm -hmm. the combination. Um, I consider myself an American. I, I you know, I'm born and raised in Israel, but and I care about Israel because my family's there and mm -hmm. a lot of people I like are there. But uh, Israel should be is just like any other country for me, except that it's mm -hmm. constantly being attacked. It's mm -hmm. constantly being attacked both by the Arab world, but beyond that, it's being attacked by the West, by the rest in terms of intellectually. So I spent a lot of time defending Israel. Not because of my, I think not because of my Jewishness, but because of the, because I, I don't feel particularly Jewish. Like it's pouring right now. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know. Right. I, I was oh, like, it was a it's great like there's one. a full moon. What the hell? What, oh, I dressed up as Ayn Rand. What's that? <laughs> I dressed up as Ayn Rand. You dressed do, up as Ayn Rand. That I did. Would, I do. Mean, that would mean interesting. You I do every photo. year. I do every year. I pick up, I pick a prominent objective. Like, I, I, I you don't give out any in 40 years. Right. I mean, a yeah. synagogue in 40 years. I don't yeah. know in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, and I don't really care. But yeah. when the anti-Semites yeah. come out, then I'm happy to go. Then you're going to shul, baby. No, I'm not going <laughs> to shul. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, going, I'm going for the intellectual but, battle and struggle, I, I, which actually matters. I, I the shul question. doesn't matter one iota. <laughs> I'm curious to hear how you answer this, because I know how I would answer this. But if theoretically Israel could be transplanted to an empty piece of land somewhere else in the world where there was a lot less friction with the with whatever around it. It's its neighbors. Would you would you would you support that? Like to what extent is the homeland 
uh, part of it important to you? I mean, remember that Herzl voted to establish the Jewish state in Uganda when the mm-hmm. British suggested that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm with Herzl. Uh, now, Uganda is mm-hmm. probably not very good because it's not abandoned, and they would have had to fight Idi Amin instead of Yasser Arafat. It would have been the same story. Uh, if there truly was an abandoned place and truly was going to be free and, tr- you know, truly, you know, I don't know if the United States carved out a piece of itself and said, here, establish your own country. Jews will always, re- you know, we'll, it's called we'll- Boca. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could, we could, we, we could do, we could do Southern Florida and just, just be done with it. Right. Um, then yeah, I, I, I'd support that. Uh, yeah. I, 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 you know, today I wouldn't support it only because I'd view it again as a, as a, um, a surrender. Mm-hmm. And I think that would embolden uh, Islamists, mm-hmm. Muslim fanatics to go after more and more Western countries. I mean, Spain was theirs once. Why not retake it? Uh, you know, the, the Balkans and, and uh, Greece and uh, much of that area was theirs. They made it all the way to the gates of Vienna. So so uh, I, I, I think I, I dread anything that emboldens Islamists because I think ultimately... They want all of us, Jews, non-Jews. They want us all to convert to Islam and, and have Sharia law. And as the West gets weaker, that crazy fantasy of theirs, which is insane, becomes more realistic. And you think probably I find that uh, the anti-Semitism of the world that creeps up ever would find a way to hate a Jewish state wherever it may be. I agree. <laughs> That's true. That yeah. is true. Um, yeah. You know. I mean, I'm not excited. I, I You know. Israel's got a, a, a great place. It's got a great country. It, it just needs to subdue its neighbors and, uh, mm-hmm. and get on with living. I mean, if anybody's been to Israel, if you haven't been to Israel, it's really hard to judge Israel. But Israel is an incredibly prosperous place. It's an exciting place, a dynamic place. It's, it's you know, it, it has more unicorns per capita than any place other than Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it is uh, innovative. And uh, and it's fun. And I left because I didn't like it. So, you know, it, but it's still a pretty amazing place. Um, but uh, yeah. And, and, and the nice thing about Israel is if I don't know if you're just a little different than everybody else, they don't treat you horribly. You, you know, Tel Aviv is like the gate capital of the Middle East or, or mm-hmm. even Europe. Uh, it's it's just a it's just a pretty not as free as I would want, but a pretty free, dynamic cool culture and um yeah people should go visit people should go experience it um i'm back to the just a quick question on so in terms of solutions going forward in 20 years from now how do you feel about this idea that if israel's not going to take decisive action but people use this claim about the settlements which i consider a marginal issue not a fundamental issue but these like sort of half-ass attempts to say like we'll build we'll, we'll, we'll say one thing and we'll do another thing i don't know to what extent that's true because i know policies in israel in terms of to get approval to build somewhere actually goes through a lot of bureaucracy israel is not just expanding whenever it feels like it but i feel like to what extent is it destructive to israel and self-defeating to not have a clear decision here like if you're going to say this is and and if you're going to cede the territory and concede that this is disputed territory and then still continue to sort of have this non you know gray solution that's just going to be lead to more instability it, it's horrible i mean the solution should be israel should reoccupy the entire west bank and gaza for 20 years mm-hmm. help re-educate the population and then talk about a two-state solution mm-hmm. but so so we should have a clear strategic agenda a clear strategic path to go into the future returning to the status quo which is what they're going to do we all know mm-hmm. they're going to do that they'll yeah. they'll change it a little, mix it up a little bit. There'll be some international force in Gaza. Maybe the Saudis will be there. Maybe the Egyptians, I don't know. But um, it, it's just suicidal. It's, it's, it's again, it's, it's guaranteeing more violence in the distant future. But it buys Israel time, and I think the Israelis will go for it. So they'll get uh, 10 years of relative peace on the Gaza front and not clear what will happen on the West Bank uh, with it. Um, look at Until the whole radicals fill that vacuum or something. Yeah, yeah the whole Gaza. settlement thing is a joke. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's the problems with the settlements. I don't want to, and and some of the settlements are completely illegitimate. It should be broken up. But look, Israel has dismantled settlements in the past. Yeah. They they did it in the Sinai, right? I mean, I yeah. I remember I used to hike in the Sinai. I used to go along the Red Sea, some of the best snorkeling in the world. When I was a teenager, we used to go in the Sinai all the time, and there were Israeli settlements in the Sinai. When they cut a peace deal with the Egyptians, 
they literally evacuated. There was a city, Yamit, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a, a little town, a real town. Mm -hmm. And they evacuated everything and they brought everything back to Israel and they gave it all to Egypt. And then when they left Gaza in 2005, there were settlements in Gaza and they completely evacuated. They literally had to use force and violence mm -hmm. to drag the settlers out of their homes, people who had invested a significant amount of their time and effort and livelihood. And... Um, and they moved them out of there. So uh, it's a red herring to say that the problem there is settlements. If, if mm -hmm. the Palestinians were truly, first of all, look, if the Palestinians really wanted peace, really wanted peace and prosperity, into, they would love the settlements. They would say, we want more Jews in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. These Jews, they bring capital, they bring expertise, they bring factories and jobs. Please bring more Jewish settlements into our midst mm -hmm. so that we can benefit uh, mutually from all the economic activity they create. And let's have a free trade agreement with Israel and let's do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the first thing the Gazans did when the settlements were evacuated was go in and smash the greenhouses that were built there, the factories, the equipment. They destroyed everything because they didn't want to touch anything. They didn't want to use anything that had been tainted by Jews having built it, right? Mm -hmm. You can't negotiate with a mentality like that. You can't have peace with a mentality like that. So the day the Arabs say, oh, we're not against settlements. We want them here. That's the day they're ready for peace. Wow. Okay. So effectively, <laughs> the Marshall Plan for the, for the West Bank and Gaza, uh, in shorthand, is sort of the, a better, you know, the, the approach. Post-World War II, how we were able to rebuild culturally from the ground up these societies to be yeah but hostile. they have to be willing to yes accept that the germans the yeah. japanese did not resist you know mm -hmm. you know general macarthur wrote a constitution for japan with his assistant they, mm -hmm. they literally sat down and wrote the constitution and and went to the emperor and said this is your new constitution they didn't ask him for permission they didn't ask him to vote mm -hmm. and they they crammed the constitution down the japanese throat it's still the constitution in Japan today, and Japan has benefited enormously from that. Right. So you need to get to the point where the Palestinians are not resisting the idea of a kind of a, in a sense, it's a, a political and, and monetary Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're, they're willing to embrace liberty, and they're willing to embrace their Jewish neighbors, and they're willing to live in peace side by side. Mm -hmm. It seems like in the Gulf states the, uh, uh, and Saudi Arabia, Abrahamic Accords, do you see like elements in that part of the world that are exerting a little bit of influence towards modernity? Is there a little bit of hope there that this could be, have, uh, I mean, there's obviously these regional uh, conflicts between Iran and Saudi Arabia that maybe are the motivators here, but it seems like obviously something that's in the hands of a monarch that, that, that the, the next monarch who's not modern can just undo everything. Exactly. But, it's, it's, you know? How can you trust any of these things when these cultures are fundamentally authoritarian? Uh, you know, it, it, it was hard to trust the Chinese that they were liberating and they were moving in the right. I mean, they were in, moving for a lot, but as soon as Xi, a mm -hmm. different dictator comes about and he decides, no, we're going to move again, away from freedom, then it moves away from freedom. What mm. happens when the next emir of Kuwait, uh, the next emir of uh, Abu Dhabi, or the next emir of, the uh, next king of Saudi Arabia change their mind and go in a different direction? What happens then? Yeah. It's very unstable. The cultures themselves have not dramatically, significantly shifted. You know, when, 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 when Saudi uh, women can walk around in miniskirts and bikinis and uh, drive cars... And uh, when atheists are not uh, put in prison for life and when adultery, uh, they're not stoned to death, then I'd say, OK, maybe Saudi Arabia is ready to embrace Western values. But what they want right now is kind of the industry and the wealth and the technology of the West without embracing the political liberty that is associated with the West mm -hmm. and without em embracing, more importantly, the individual liberty, right? The, the right of the individuals to live their life as they see fit mm -hmm. that the West embraces for the most part. And without embracing individual liberty, everything else is empty and, and shallow. And uh, I, I don't trust them. I don't trust no. them at all. But one, one could argue that with economic liberty first, that incrementally starts that push that be, can, can become unavoidable, similar to what happened with the Soviet Union. A lot of people said once they started having the Western influences of being able to buy mm. clothes, blue jeans, go see Bruce Springsteen, it, it all of a sudden reached a threshold where the regime could no longer maintain uh, these people's thirst for freedom. 
A lot of us believe that, me included, um, yeah. particularly when it comes to China, and China's proved us wrong, mm. right? Uh, we got economic liberty, quite a bit of economic liberty. At some point, it was easier to do business in China than in the U.S. They were, and that has all shifted. That's all changed over the last 10 years. Uh, so I don't think that is a necessity. Yes. Also, <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I mean, okay, well, yeah. let's see. I mean, yeah. if, if MBS is willing for women to walk around in jeans – Mm -hmm. in um, in Saudi Arabia and go to Bruce Springsteen conferences, not, uh, concerts, not just when they travel to the West, but in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia itself, then I will admit to being wrong and celebrate that day. That would be fantastic. I've, I've, when the day the Jews are invited to Mecca and Medina to visit mm -hmm. as tourists, mm -hmm. that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's happening in my lifetime. I don't think it's happening in your lifetime. The uh, Emirates maybe, is looking I, okay. I, I hope I'm wrong. I've seen, I, I've seen I some I'm comedians. Wrong. I've seen comedians perform some pretty raunchy stand up in the Emirates, and people are laughing. And that's a sign of when people can tolerate humor. It's a good sign of freedom or a thirst for it, at least. When they, can I take think, in the humor. Emirates, you know, again, yeah. uh, you know, the, the Emirates are, are built on semi-slave labor, so you, you know, you, you have to watch out for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the way they treat women is still not quite up to par, right? Uh, right. So. Maybe European women can walk around there and be European, but their own women um, mm -hmm. are not exactly treated well. But yes, I mean, I, I hope that's right. I hope mm -hmm. change is really happening in these places. Yeah. Uh, I'm just not yet convinced. I'm also, you know, so, but I hope I'm wrong. I, I yeah. definitely hope I'm wrong. I want freedom, relative freedom, not even, abs not even the full freedom that I advocate for. Yeah. I want relative freedom to blossom around mm -hmm. the world, in, uh, particularly in the Middle East, because that will obviously change the entire dynamics of the yeah. Israeli-Palestinian. I mean, look, here's the reality, right? The reality is that when the, when the uh, Arab Spring happened, what was it now, 13 years ago, mm -hmm. when the Arab Spring happened, and a lot of us were optimistic here, were the, they were rising up, they were using tech to coordinate this, and they, the, you know, this was a, a, a real change in the Arab world. The reality is that the change they wanted was to get rid of authoritarian government and replace it with Islamic government, right? I mean, who got elected in Egypt once you had a fair election? The Muslim Brotherhood, not a friend of individualism or individual liberty or individual, and, and that is true in many of the places around the Middle East, that the worst elements got elected. It's happened in Algeria, it's happened elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think there's still a long way to go before the Arab world embraces what I think is the most important, which is individual liberty, is is mm -hmm. treating people as individuals and everything that that implies. Yeah, my I guess on this last uh, segment here, we'll wrap up here. But um, what do you make of sort of the new elements that are ascendant or reoccurring, reoccur like uh, uh, that have existed before, but are sort of back in the America First movement of the United States domestically, where it used to sort of be where the more progressive you got, you would see a hostility to Israel. And now you're sort of seeing this, it's always been there sort of the Pat Buchanan sort of isolationist parts of the Republican Party, but sort of in a post-Trump uh, movement now where this America First like coated with a little anti-Semitism flavor in it where it's the Jews are controlling our foreign policy, APAC's controlling us, the globalists, all these Jews in government. You made this case before of how Jews are represented, overly represented in, in intellectual life. And that was sort of seen as a, an accomplishment or a virtue or just, just a, a matter of fact. But a lot of people with nefarious intentions are using that against the Jewish community to say, yeah. see, look, look how they're controlling society and our decisions. We can name names, Candace mm -hmm. Owen, Tucker Carlson, and, and there's a lot of others. People the who, suspicion who, of Jews, yeah. Yeah, who used to be in the mainstream of the conservative movement and are now mm -hmm. on the anti-Semitic fringes of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's it's... It's almost inevitable that the more irrational a culture becomes, and look, I, I when Donald Trump was elected, this was inevitable. Uh, he is the bringer of irrationality to American politics, the bringer of chaos, the bringer of the bringer of chaos, the bringer it. of chaos. Red, I mean, the bringer it, it, of irrationality. That's what I am. I it's love it. good. There's a fantasy <laughs> novel there to be written. Uh, yeah. he, he is. Uh, he was he destroyed the Republican Party. The Republican Party is not the same party at all than it was eight years ago. And it's much, much worse. It's certainly much, much worse on Israel on Ukraine on mm -hmm. uh, on American foreign policy. Uh, not that it was great before that, but now it's much worse. And, uh, it, you know, it's bad on 
not wanting to uh, not wanting to free up the economy. It's bad on uh, entitlements. It's bad on all the things that it should be good on. So it's not good on anything, right? Uh, the new Republican Party. It's it used to be the Republicans were at least a decent opposition party. Now, if you look at what the Republicans are doing in the House of Representatives, it's a party that's an absolute unmitigated disaster. So now we've got two parties that are unmitigated disasters. So, uh, and and maybe there's an opening for something new. I, I'm, but it's hard to imagine where it's going to come from. Uh, so yes, I think the right, the fringe on the right has always been anti-Semitic. The fringe has expanded; it's grown. So it's not a fringe anymore. It's it's dabbling in. I mean, Tucker Carlson can't be viewed as fringe. Mm-hmm. He's he's got millions and millions of followers. And of course, the left has gotten much much worse in terms of its anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. And it's not the fringe in the left anymore. It's basically. Mm-hmm. Half of young people in America, you know, uh, uh, hate yeah. Israel. So, uh, you know, on both sides, Israel and Jews more broadly are in trouble. And I don't see how this gets better because mm-hmm. I don't think the right is going to get better. The, I mean, the only reason anti-Semitism hasn't become full-fledged policy on the right is because evangelicals, for bizarre, <laughs> irrational, ridiculous reasons, love Israel. And uh, Donald Man, Trump, you're making no friends, Your Honor. Donald Trump <laughs> needs the evangelical vote. I never make friends. Friends, I hate friends. you too. I hate you too. You know, you're bad. You're bad. You settle. Overrated. Bad. Overrated. Yeah, yeah. Friends. Friends. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. A real kidding. individualist. Now. I love um, friends. I love yeah. friends, but I want my friends to share my values, not not right. not not to be my enemies. Um, do you think the term anti-Semitism, especially as coming off of the woke uh, BLM anti-racist cult elements of our culture, gets thrown around too much, so that when we do see it, it can be get, can very hard to identify because it now becomes an excuse to cover for everything? I had a conversation with Candace Owens a few months ago, post October seventh. We spoke for about an hour, and a lot of what was revealed to me was that there was just simply a lot of lack of knowledge and uh, ignorance to the issues that got confused and muddled, and she associated this charge of anti-Semitism with a sort of leftist cancel culture element. And I had to say, you're drawing the wrong conclusions here. That just because uh, there's been a lot of elements in our society that call out racism where it doesn't exist doesn't mean when we do see it when it does exist, it's it. You don't call it out. I mean, this this confusion yeah, but, about free speech and cancel culture. And now you're seeing there's been a lot of activity on at the Daily Wire and yeah. drama and whatnot. But I mean, since your conversation with Candace, obviously her views have, did not change, and and she didn't <laughs> moderate them. She didn't rethink a position or consider it in great depth. Obviously, because. She's become worse with time, not better. Um, I mean, I we'll do a round two. I'll, we'll do a round two. I mean, I don't know if Candace is explicitly thinks in her mind Jews are horrible people. They should all be, you know, uh, wiped out. I don't think she holds that. But does she hold anti-Semitic ideas about Jews controlling X, Y, Z and and uh, and blaming Jews for the, for the kind of their influence on? There's a suspicion or something. Yeah, I mean, some look sort. at how she, what she said about about Ben Shapiro, mm-hmm. right? And and the argument that Ben, that she and Tucker Carlson made about Ben Shapiro caring more about Israel than the United States, when, I mean, Ben Shapiro <laughs> has done so much. I mean, I'm, mm-hmm. I, I, I oppose a lot of what Ben Shapiro stands for. <laughs> <but> ben Shapiro, <laughs> almost a real friend. Now you have been on the show. Has done yeah. so much <laughs> to to advocate for certain freedoms and certain liberties in the United States. He's done so much for the quote right in the U.S. Agree with still him true altruist, him. altruistic for you, but yes, I yeah. To, to, to <laughs> claim that Ben Shapiro is anti-American in some way or doesn't care about America is so dishonest. Mm-hmm. And what would lead to that dishonesty? Only. Uh, some tinge of anti-Semitism it's and dual loyalty. It, it's the old charge of the dual loyalty. Yeah, time. dual loyalty was Dreyfus, right? Yeah. So bringing back the Dreyfus argu- uh, argument on somebody who has spent his career defending uh, good ideas or some good ideas uh, about America. So it's yeah. it's. I mean, one it's, has to wonder it's what's motivating so, it. Yeah. Are they anti-Semitic? Yeah, even you know, a lot of people are anti-Semitic without knowing it. A lot of people anti- hold anti-Semitic ideas without completely hating all Jews and again wanting to be Nazis. Mm-hmm. I'm not or feed that, in, or feed into a general. Either they, they they don't might not hold the view in their heart, but they embolden those ideas that create suspicion yeah. about the Jew or Jews. Yeah, or embolden yeah. certainly embolden anti-Semites out there who are suspicious of Jewish control or influence. Yes. And some yeah. of them, like Candace Owens, just. If I can say yeah. so, just don't think they they don't use that gray matter, and she's very <laughs> influenced by the people who follow her, and she's very influenced by certain people on the right, and they they you know she absorbs that stuff without 
uh, without really, cr- uh, you know, any kind of critical, uh, critical, critical assessment of it. And mm-hmm. I see it on a lot of issues. You know, what she said, that the pharmaceutical companies in the United States are the most mm-hmm. evil organizations, in all, in, you know, in the world today. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. insanity. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Candace has a lot of problems. Uh, it, being influenced by anti-Semitic ideas is one of several. Okay. To be continued um, on that one. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I do have one last question. Um, it's not really political. Um, do you mind if I ask Yeah, it? yeah. We'll um, wrap up here. You know, it, it's pretty It's pretty uh, rare to find someone who has values and principles and then actually, like, lives by them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, you know, and you're, you're a pretty striking example of that. I'm wondering, you know, I, I think I would love to do a lot of stuff. I believe in a lot of stuff. And then I just get up and do the same thing I did yesterday. <laughs> do you have any, any advice for someone who's, like, having trouble, like, you know, I, I really don't believe in this thing. I'd really like to leave my job or work for an institution that that is more in line with with how I, with what I feel, you know, with what I think, but can't seem to to do it. Do you have any advice for them? Sure, I have a whole series on on my uh, podcast called Yaron's Rules for Life," inspired yeah. by Jordan. Jordan, ha! Yeah. Well, you know, I should copyright that so I can get some royalties. You, you know? should. It's you like, should have well, copyrighted it. Didn't you know? get it anyway. Ha! So well, there is the Yaron's Rules you know? for Life, <laughs> which is I don't know twenty episodes where I cover a lot of this stuff. But, but look, yeah. first you have to make sure that the values you have are the right values. They're rational, they're pro-life, they're pro-happiness, the, 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 the good ones. And then you have to just, you have to commit yourself to, to following them. And you see, the beauty of objectivism, of Ayn Rand's ideas, is that the values are actually, the moral is the practical. If you live up to your morality, you will all also be happy and successful and, and I think self-fulfilled. And... You know, this frustration that you feel comes from, I think, comes from the fact that you're not living up to those values. So one, are the values the, good, the right values? And B, why aren't you living up to them? Are you not convinced that you will benefit from them? You know, it, you convince yourself, I'm really get life is going to be better if I do these things. And, and then just do it, right? There is a, a certain issue of just will, willing yourself to, to do it. And, and, and that can be hard, but incredibly rewarding. And once you do it once, becomes much easier over time because it, you know, you reinforce it. You, you get positive feedback. Do you think that objectivist ideas and the approach to communicating those ideas could benefit from a little bit more of the emotional components? Because, yeah, facts don't care about your feelings, the famous Ben Shapiro line, but I think feelings process facts. I mean, the way people understand things is through stories, is through emotional resonance in order to connect with certain things. That's a, a funny statement about a philosophy that came into the world through two novels, yeah. Through two stories filled mm-hmm. with emotion, filled with characters, filled with real life. But, but no children. What's that? No children, though, people have said. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying in the modern day. I, I mean, do I get credit for having children? I mean, what, what, I mean, it's a silly question because, because <laughs> yeah, so she wrote a novel and there are no children in the novel. The novel no, isn't yeah, supposed yeah. to cover every aspect of human life in great detail. And she didn't have children, so she right. didn't write about children. So what? It, it, it's not, she didn't make a statement about, oh, people who have children, bad on you. Uh, quite no, no, country. no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying how it applies in, in like, uh, in, uh, in, in regular life to connect to people sort of where they're at. Um, I, I'm just joking because people have said like, there's no children. So, so novel. somebody should but write a novel from an children's book. perspective <laughs> about a family, yeah. uh, but it has to be heroic. It has to be dramatic. It has to be, you know, it has to be, uh, it can't just be. A, a, a naturalistic description of family. But look, absolutely emotions have a role, stories have a role, mm-hmm. um, and, and stories are important. Uh, I'm a pretty passionate guy, so mm-hmm. I, I, you know, it's, it's not like I'm emotionless, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't come across mm-hmm. as a robot, do I? Uh, so, you know, but I also believe that sometimes in cases like what we're living through today, a little bit of cognitive dissonance for people is good. So saying mm-hmm. things that cause people to go, whoa, did he just say that? is maybe a, a way to shock them out of the complacency and shock them out of the just the, the grayness of the intellectual debate today, which I think is mm. pretty gray. And it's pretty, uh, you know, everybody basically agrees on ethics. And then it's just an argument about who we're going to sacrifice to whom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I want to break away from that because I'm not for sacrificing anybody to anybody. Yeah. And also, you know, within the Ayn Rand's writings, there's this this emphasis on the spirit, the spiritual component Absolutely. of life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I purpose have artwork here. That's David, yeah. by the way. Mm-hmm. 
He's, oh. You can't see his leg, but his leg. Another is, Jew. Yeah. His, his, his <laughs> foot is on uh, Goliath's head. I don't think that's politically correct anymore. You know, chopping yeah, yeah. people's heads off, and uh, right. you know, even if they're monsters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so that's David, and and mm-hmm. that's a Vermeer. So I'm big on art, on on classical values. music junkie. Yeah. What's that? I know. I know you're a classical music guy. I love classical yeah. music. Absolutely. Josh, Joshua Bell, right? Is that the that that's your guy, right? Violinist. Uh, Who? Bell? Did you say? Bell? Bell? The Bell, violinist? Bell, the, the yeah, kid. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> well, he's not a kid anymore. Yeah. but he's he's really good. I saw him in London a few couple of years ago. Right. But yeah, I love classical music. I love a lot mm-hmm. of arts. I, mm-hmm. I I love. Yep. All right. Well. I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, Dr. Yaron Brook, uh, chairman of the Anne Rand Institute, thank you so much for engaging with us in this conversation. I think it was illuminating, clarifying, and would love to do it again sometime. Thank you. My pleasure. And you. Where can people find you online? Uh, yeah. Just go to YouTube, Yaron Brook mm-hmm. Show, or just Google Yaron Brook, and, and mm-hmm. you'll be flooded with stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, and Twitter. Twitter and okay. YouTube are the places okay. I mostly hang out in. All right. Well, thank you again for... For, for schmoozing with us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. 